I've got a slide of the Texas New Mexico plant. For those of you who are interested in the paper that Dr. Gonzalez Oropesa mentioned that he had written, it will be available on the uh, San Jacinto Battleground Conservancy website, David Singleton tells me, but before too many days uh, or maybe a couple of weeks, it will be available very soon on the website. So uh, you don't need to ask us to email it to you or to uh, send it to you. It's going to be available on the website. We're going to keep covering the borders of Texas, uh, more on the Rio Grande. The Rio Grande is such an important boundary uh, and such a controversial one that we're going to have two people speaking about that. Uh, our second is Dr. Jerry Thompson, and then we'll get to those straight lines across the American West that I mentioned earlier on today. Um, but first, let me introduce uh, Dr. Jerry Thompson, uh, who's been teaching Texas history now for, I believe, around 45 years. Most of that time at the institution now known as Texas A&M International University in uh, Laredo, where he is Regents Professor of History. Um, he has written uh, numerous uh, books uh, and edited many as well. Uh, his most recent of those 20 or so books is uh, Civil War and Revolution in, on the Rio Grande Frontier, which is one not only the uh, the T.R. Fehrenbach Award, but also the Kate Brooks Bates Award for the best book uh, in Texas history. Um, my particular favorite of Jerry's books is called 50 Miles in a Fight because we have a mutual interest in a man named Samuel Peter Heinzelman. Uh, I've learned his name was Old Sourdough, uh, his nickname. Uh, I'm interested in him because he was the uh, business partner and obituary writer for one Hermann Ehrenberg, uh, who, who you'll hear about more someday whenever I finish that damn book. Uh, but uh, uh, watch this space. Ehrenberg is going to be, the, is going to be coming soon. But the reason, the reason uh, I'm so, uh, uh, I have so much admiration for Jerry is because Heinzelman's uh, handwriting, from which Jerry has uh, uh, produced this uh, partial uh, version of his, uh, of his journal and, and, and the annotations and explanation, Heinzelman's handwriting was so lousy that Heinzelman couldn't read it, uh, and so that by his own admission. And so uh, Jerry has done a, a real job for all of us in bringing um, <clears throat> that book, 50 Miles and a Fight, um, Samuel Peter Heinzelman's Journal of Texas and the Cortina War. Uh, Heinzelman uh, was here um, in Texas before the Civil War, fought for the Union not very well, I'm afraid, during the Civil War, and then came back during Reconstruction. And it was uh, when he was in Galveston that he learned of, of Hermann Ehrenberg's uh, death in uh, the Far West in, in, in California and wrote a brief obituary for the uh, Gal for Flake's Galveston Weekly, which was then copied by the New York Times two weeks later. It took me, two, it took me a year and a half to figure out who wrote that obituary, but it was almost certainly Samuel Peter Heinzelman. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough uh, to have uh, Jerry as my guide through the old town of Laredo, the capital of the once Republic of the Rio Grande, um, a, a, a place that was contested by uh, Texas uh, briefly a few times during the period of the Republic, but certainly never, uh, never held. Um, I, Jerry, Jerry uh, lives through Laredo's summers, which is uh, uh, enough to give him a, a hero uh, medal himself. Uh, but um, he has an encyclopedic knowledge of, uh, of, of the period of the uh, from, from the Republic of Texas up through the early state of Texas and into the Civil War with special expertise on uh, the Civil War on the Rio Grande. Um, I am uh, eager to hear what he's going to tell us uh, about uh, that boundary and uh, what it has meant for Texas over the years. Dr. Jerry Thompson. Thank you kindly, Jim. Some of those summers I retreat to New Mexico. Uh, they can be indeed brutal in Laredo in the summer. Um, I'm happy to be in uh, 
Houston today. In fact, at my age, I'm happy to be anywhere. Um, or in, uh, I think, what David called the great goat roping contest or something. Uh, I always like to start my presentations with a, with a piece of humor. And I thought, since I'm coming from Laredo and live so close to the border, I would share with you the latest uh, Laredo joke. And you almost have to be a, civil, uh, a World War II veteran to appreciate this. I told this to a couple of my students, and they didn't laugh. And I figured out later why they didn't understand it. But uh, these two guys were getting on an airplane in New York. And it was very, very obvious that, uh, that one man was kind of agitated and looked kind of depressed. And they finally got on the airplane. And about an hour into the flight, the, uh, they got to talking to one another. And the guy says, well, what, what, what's wrong? He said, oh, my god. He said, uh, said, I'm being transferred down there to the Texas-Mexican border. And said, not only that, to Laredo. And, said they've got this vicious uh, drug war going on down there. And hell, I, I might be killed. I can't take my family down there. I just don't know what to do. And the guy said, look, look, he said, said I've lived there for 30 years and said, you know, people don't understand that there's a Laredo, Texas, and there's a Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, and all that violence is, a, is across the river. And said, don't worry. You're going to be fine there. Just don't worry. So about two hours into the flight, the guy that was moving to Laredo turned to the other guy, and he said, by the way, said, um, what do you do down there in Laredo? He says, oh, he says, I'm a tail gunner on a bread truck. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if, uh, if students don't know what a tail gunner is, then it's, you know, there's, 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 no, there's no humor th to that at all. And, and while I'm on a, a roll here, I was thinking of another uh, piece of humor when, uh, when Gene was speaking this morning. And it's the story of those uh, two Texas cowboys that were driving to Louisiana. And they saw this name on the map there. Looked a lot like Nacogdoches, Texas, but they couldn't pronounce this. And they were arguing about, well, you know, how, how do you say the name of this place we're coming to? Of course, it was Nacogdoches. And the one cowboy says, well, when we get into town, he said, I'm just going to stop and find out. So just as they pulled into Natchitoches, he pulled into a, a Dairy Queen there, and they went in and asked the young lady, said, how do you pronounce the name of this place? She says, Dairy Queen. Uh, <laughs> so maybe we better stop and be, be serious. Uh, uh, my job today is to discuss the, uh, the events on the Texas-Mexican border in the years following the Treaty of Velasco and the, the Battle at San Jacinto, up and through the war with Mexico in 1848, and I guess all the way up to the, the Compromise of 1850, or really the Compromises. It's, it's more than one. We always say Compromise of 1850. It's really a series of, of compromises. But I really would recommend to you, if you're seriously interested in this period, a couple of books that were written by a kind of cantankerous historian a number of years ago who taught at A&M by the name of John Nance. And John Nance wrote two books. He wrote one called After San Jacinto, and then he wrote a second book called Attack and Counterattack. Now, reading the books themselves will put you to sleep, but I use them for encyclopedias because they've got anything that anybody would ever want to know about that period of history. And then he worked the latter part of his life on the Mier expedition and produced about a 1,200-page manuscript that nobody was willing to publish. And finally, um, Archie McDonald edited that down, and that was uh, published. And I really recommend that on the Mier expedition. Uh, but like I said, all of those books are really almost like, like encyclo encyclopedias. I think we all know about the, the Treaty of Velasco. Some of you know a lot more than, than, than I do. And of course, we all know about that very eventful day in 1836 on April the 21st. Uh, certainly one of the most significant battles, I think, uh, in world history. Uh, certainly the most important 18 minutes in the history of Texas. And I don't think anyone really at the time realized 
the real long-term impact of that, of that battle. As many as 650 to 700 Mexican soldiers lay dead. As many as 730 were held as captives. Uh, the so-called Napoleon of the West had been vanquished, uh, but would, of course, reappear when uh, he goes to, to Washington. And you saw this morning that people in Mexico really don't like this guy, Santa Ana, because he gave away so much land. So they kind of joke in Mexico that his own real contribution to history was that he introduced a chicle into the United States. And I think that is a true story. I think he did give some of that to to President Andrew Jackson when they were, when they were able, to, able to meet. Uh, I think that is a true story. Uh, but that really was a crushing defeat for Santa Ana and a large part of the Mexican army. We sometimes forget that he did not command the, the entire army in, in Texas. And the question this morning was, well, you know, why didn't they just shoot him? Well, Houston said, quote, Santa Ana dead is no more than Tom, Dick, or Harry dead, but living he may avail Texas much. Well, of course, that much turned out to be that Treaty of Velasco that was signed on May the 14th on the Texas coast at the mouth of the Brazos River at that small community of Velasco. And there were actually two treaties of Velasco, as some of you know. One was public and then one was private. But in that Treaty of Velasco, Santa Ana, of course, agreed to end hostilities in Texas, uh, to order the withdrawal of the Mexican army. Now, whether they're going to follow his orders or not is another question. Uh, but he agreed, I think, more importantly, to the Rio Grande as the boundary. I think that's the real significant part of that treaty. Now, the Rio Grande had never been a significant boundary to that part in history. Uh, the Nueces had always been kind of the boundary between Coahuila in Texas and, and Nuevo Santander, and then later the, the state of Tamaulipas. Uh, so at that point, the Rio Grande really did not have that much, uh, that much significance. But it was included in that private treaty, and therefore, as of 1836, the Republic of Texas claims the Rio Grande instead of the Nueces as the boundary line between these two infant uh, republics. Uh, now, we need to emphasize, as we'll learn later, that the Texas Republic also claimed all of that land west to the, well, if you can't see it hardly, all the way west over here to the, to the Rio Grande. And Chris was making fun this morning of that Texas boundary that extended all the way up there uh, into Wyoming. Uh, but that is the boundary that the, the Texans claimed as of, of 1836, uh, which includes those little small adobe villages of, of places like uh, Santa Fe and places like Albuquerque. That is claimed as part of the Republic of Texas. Now, in December of 1838, uh, when Maribel B. Lamar became the, the, the second president of the Republic of Texas, if you don't count the the interim president. Uh, as you know, his foreign policy was far more aggressive than that of Houston, uh, especially in relation to the indigenous peoples of Texas, especially the Cherokee, as you know. And so that brings us to our very, very interesting uh, Republic of the Rio Grande. And Randall was kind enough to share, us, share with us uh, this flag that I've put on display up here. And my friend in uh, Mexico City, not my friend in Mexico City, my friend Dr. Green from Laredo, who has been doing research in Mexico City, uh, found a sketch, which fortunately is a, uh, a colored sketch in the archives there. And it appears as if that bottom color that we have dark, uh, at least in my observation of that colored copy he has, it appears to me as if that may be green, which would make a lot more sense than, than being black. So we really don't know the exact colors of that flag, but certainly the three stars uh, represented the three states of Nuevo Leon, Coahuila, and Tamaulipas. Now, how did this Republic of the Rio Grande come about? Well, it's part of this continuous struggle in Mexico 
uh, between the forces of federalism and centralism that had been going on ever since the Mexican Republic had been founded in 1821. And when we think of these Mexican Federalists, please don't confuse those Federalists with the American Federalists. They're really two different breeds of people. Uh, the Federalists in the United States, guys like Washington and Hamilton, were very interested in a strong central government, as we see in the Constitution, uh, parts of the Constitution. But in Mexico, the Federalists were the ones who really kind of wanted a, a weak central government and much more rights given to the individual states, such as the rights to select their own uh, governors, officials, uh, et cetera. Whereas the centralists, like Santa Ana, who started out as a federalist and became a centralist, uh, they're more interested in consolidating that power in, 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 in Mexico. So I think when we see the formation of this Republic of the Rio Grande in 1840, we need to see it in this light of these continuous struggles that were going on in Mexico. And as we learned this morning, Santa Ana has big problems in the Yucatan. He has big problems in Zacatecas, not just, not just, not just Texas. Well, in 1840, a group of these Mexican Federalists met there on the Rio Grande on the north bank, we think probably in modern day uh, Zapata County, downriver from Webb County, which is where Laredo is and they drew up a constitution uh, with a man by the name of Jesus Cardenas as president. Antonio Canales was selected to head the army and they eventually wound up setting up their capital in Laredo. So we take great pride, or at least the Chamber of Commerce takes great pride in saying that Laredo really was under, under more flags than was the Republic of Texas. And then recently, I, a couple of years ago, I went up to, to Eagle Pass, and they were opening their, their Eight Flags Museum. And I said, well, where did you, know, where'd you get that eighth flag? We in Laredo have seven, but all of a sudden you have eight. And the guy said, oh, you know, uh, we want to count the Comanche Lance. So somehow they were trying to outdo, outdo Laredo. Uh, but the real hero, I think, in this Republic of the Rio Grande, one of the most fascinating individuals, uh, which Zapata County is named after. A lot of people in Zapata County even think the county was named after the, the 20th century revolutionary hero, Emiliano Zapata. It's naturally named after this guy, Antonio Zapata, who was a rancher in the area who becomes one of the leaders. Canales is not very good, so. Antonio Zapata becomes the real leader, at least the cavalry commander of this Republic of the Rio Grande. And he was eventually captured, uh, court-martialed, and executed. And they recently found the court-martial proceedings in Mexico City and uh, was beheaded, much as Father Hidalgo had been beheaded. And not only did the Mexican centralists behead him, uh, they took his head and put it in a cask of mezcal and brought it down to Laredo and then proceeded to put it on display in the plaza there for any Federalist to see as a, as a symbol that you don't revolt against the Mexican government. And then they took it down river to his hometown of Guerrero and put it on a pike on the plaza there across the street from his family. Uh, so can you imagine every day looking out and seeing your father's head on a, on a stick out there in the, the plaza in, in Guerrero? And there's a very good historian who studied here at the University of Houston who wrote his uh, very good master's thesis on the Republic of the Rio Grande. And he found where the uh, priest in Guerrero performed a funeral mass for the head. Now, we don't know about the torso, but certainly there was a mass for the head. And he also found in the records there where Antonio Zapata is clearly listed as mulatto, which is very interesting and something that I, I did not know before. But eventually the centralist crushed this Republic of the Rio Grande. Uh, Canales fled, came to San Antonio, went eventually to Victoria, eventually to Austin, uh, met with President Mayor Bo B. Lamar, and of course, Texas is very interested in this Republic of the Rio Grande. There's a lot of correspondence that fly back and forth because the Republic of the Rio Grande could serve as a perfect buffer between Texas and Mexico. 
but there's not much of a discussion as to what would be the boundaries of this new Republic of the Rio Grande because clearly they would want the Nueces and not the, the Rio Grande as the boundary. But Canales tried to rebuild his army, uh, not only made up of Mexicans, but also a lot of Anglo-Texans and uh, a few Native Americans, and then eventually uh, was captured or defeated at, at Ciudad Victoria. And there's a lot of intrigue in this. He kind of really went over to the, to the other side. So that Republic of the Rio Grande only lasted really for about 243 tumultuous days. But those were very, very interesting days. Now, Lamar is also responsible the next year in 1841 of launching something that you heard quite a bit about this morning, which is that ill-fated uh, Santa Fe expedition under General Hugh McLeod. There's a new, new biography of, of the general. He was a West Point graduate and, and should have known what he was doing. And we were discussing last night how one of the, the men who went with McLeod was Jose Antonio Navarro from the Texas Revolution fame that maybe we'll hear more about next year. But in all, there were 321 men, soldiers, artillerymen, a teamsters, a 21 ox-drawn wagons loaded down with supplies. A merchants had about $200,000 in goods, which is a lot. And they called themselves the Santa Fe Pioneers and saw this really kind of as a commercial attempt to tie Texas to Santa Fe. I think what the Texans really wanted was control of the, the Santa Fe Trail that, that proved to be quite lucrative economically. If you could get hold to the southern end of that and, and lobby the same tariffs that the Mexicans were, you could make a lot of money from that trade. So what they were offering the Nuevo Mexicanos was the opportunity to kind of join this new infant Republic of Texas. Uh, on June 19, 1841, the expedition set out from Kinney's Fort on Brush Creek, about 20 miles north of Austin. And they didn't know much about the geography of West Texas, so they traveled across the Brazos, uh, then west across the Cross Timbers, kind of past what is modern day Wichita Falls. They're getting really close to the Red River. And then they turned west, uh, harassed by the Comanches as they went, running low on provisions, uh, ran out of water a couple of times, could not find a very good route or a, a suitable route uh, to get the wagons up the Caprock and spent days trying to do that. And they finally decided, as they were running out of steam and water and everything else, to send an advance party on ahead to contact uh, the Nuevo Mexicanos. And they made contact uh, with some Comancheros uh, near the little village, it's still a little village today, of Anton Chico. And the governor of New Mexico, very famous during the war that was to follow, uh, Manuel Armijo decided that these guys really were a bunch of bandits and not only captured the advance party, but then captured the, the other group that was following them maybe 150 miles behind along the, the Canadian River near modern day Tucumcari uh, and put them in chains and sent them, uh, sent them all the way down the Rio Grande across the Chihuahuan Desert all the way to, to Mexico City. Uh, so the, the, the Santa Fe expedition in reality turned out to be a disaster. But the, and I don't think I'm, I'm having the same problem that, let me go backwards. Somewhere I had a, yeah, there we go. Uh, George Wilkin Kendall's famous, well-received book, Narrative of the Texan Santa Fe Expedition, uh, was widely read uh, and I think what, the, what that served to do was really arouse uh, people in Texas, people in the United States as to the suffering of the Santa Fe prisoners uh, who were, as I said, taken all the way to Mexico City and some of them thrown into Perote prison that you'll see in a moment. And that really became a, a piece of diplomatic contention uh, between Mexico and the United States, the United States trying to get these guys freed 
and even the, the, the government of Great Britain uh, becomes very much involved in this. And some of them were released in April of, of 1842. And don't forget the name of that book, Attack and Counterattack. Uh, largely as a result of the Santa Fe Expedition uh, and the kind of wild actions of the Texas Navy, the new president of Mexico, the new president of Mexico, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, decides to send an expedition into Texas under General Rafael Vasquez. And Vasquez actually crosses the Rio Grande in March of 1842 with 1,400 men and actually takes San Antonio de Bejar, uh, raises the Mexican flag, and declared Texas under Mexican law. Now, he withdrew a couple of days later, but he took back with him about 100 prisoners that he took in, in San Antonio, including guys like, like Samuel Maverick. Now, by this time, Texas has a new president for the second time, a Sam Houston. And Sam Houston has got to retaliate to this somehow. So he raises a small army under General Alexander Somerville. Uh, Houston's kind of trying to play for time and trying to, I think, promote peace as best as he can. And Somerville is not overly excited about organizing this army. But when they, when they finally do get underway after they had agreed to sell something like 10 million acres of land to raise money, uh, they have all kinds of problems getting down to the Rio Grande. Uh, they get caught in some swamps there in Atascosa County. The Nueces River is flooded, and they have a hard time getting, getting across that. But the Somerville expedition finally arrives uh, in Laredo. And although Laredo is on the north bank of the river, uh, they proceed to just sack the community. Uh, they stole everything conceivable. Uh, some of the guys were drunk. They took uh, uh, logs as battering ramps and battered down the, the doors. Uh, there's inventories in the Laredo archives of the items that they took. Somerville just completely lost control of the army. And the guys said that they even found something strange in the town that that looked kind of like tobacco that you could smoke it and it kind of made you feel kind of kind of strange. Uh, so these Texans were having a, a, a really, really, I think, uh, really, really great time in Laredo. And when Somerville finally got them to return all the items that they had stolen, uh, he said that it amounted to the size of a small house. And at that point, he's kind of so disgusted with all of this that he uh, just basically throws up his arms and says, well, I'm going back to San Antonio. But some of these very, very determined Texans under a gentleman by the name of Fisher, decide, Tom Green, decide that they will continue down the river. And that's where I was trying to show you the, uh, the, the Navy of the Republic of Texas. Now, Dr. Nance used to get really excited when you dare refer to this as the, 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 the Navy of the Republic of Texas. He claims at this point that this Navy was, was totally illegitimate but they certainly raised their Texas flag and they did have some small boats. And although this is greatly exaggerated, there's no cliffs along the, the Rio Grande that even look like that. There's no doubt that some of these guys did sail down the river and they did claim to be, they did claim to be part of the, part of the, the Texas Navy. Now, let me continue on uh, with the story if I can. Uh, I've lost my notes, but that's okay. Um, they get down to Guerrero, where they force a loan on the alcalde there, and then they proceed, they were on the south bank by this time, they proceed from, from Guerrero all the way down to Mier, and actually take Mier. Uh, and they're in Mier when they're basically attacked by a much larger Mexican army, and a fierce fight it goes on there a few days before Christmas. And the Texans basically were fighting from house to house, rooftop to rooftop. This is a furious fight. But they were so greatly outnumbered that they eventually ran out of, out of ammunition and everything possible and eventually surrendered. So I think at that point, the Somerville Expedition kind of becomes what we call the, the Mier Expedition. 
And these guys, like the Santa Fe expedition, are put in chains. They're marched down the south bank of the river through these small communities like Camargo, all the way to Matamoros. There's big ceremonies, bands play. There's wreaths that are put out in the streets. And then they're marched all the way to Monterrey and then into the mountains to Saltillo. And then you know the story from there, I think. They start into the desert. And they get way down there in the middle of that desert, about halfway to, to Matuala on the road to San Luis Potosí. And at a kind of ranch headquarters, a hacienda in the desert there at Salado, uh, they decide to make a break and kill some of their Mexican guards and escaped into the desert. Well, that's the worst conceivable place to try and escape because there's no water, there's no food there. Uh, most of the guys were either recaptured or some just disappeared. Very few ever made it back to Texas. Well, then that ends up in the famous, famous drawing of the black beans at Salado. And somewhere here I've got the exact number of guys who drew the black beans, 17. Mm -hmm. uh, misfortunate guys who drew the, the black bean. Uh, Bigfoot Wallace said that he was watching carefully and he noticed that those black beans were bigger than the white beans. Black bean meant death, a white bean meant that you could survive. So as he was reaching in the earthen jar, uh, he could tell that some beans were larger than others and drew a, drew a white bean. Now this image, there are others, but this is probably the most famous one by Frederick Remington, was made in 1896 drawing of the black beans. Look at something very interesting. Look at these uh, Mexican soldiers here. And I don't know if Frank is around, but I've never seen Mexican soldiers that look exactly like, or have uniforms exactly like these guys. But Jim, are you looking carefully? Chris can give you a really, really great lecture on the art of the Alamo and San Jacinto at this period of American history and the racism that's involved. A look at some of these Mexican soldiers and how Remington depicts them. This particular guy here looks exactly like a monkey. And you remember some of those guys in the Alamo painting you were pointing out that have those, that, that similar facial features. And I mean, you see the, the, the real people, and they've done this with, with generals in the Mexican War. You see the real Mexican generals and then you see the way they were depicted. And they're depicted as being guys with big mustaches and kind of evil looking. And then you see the real photograph and they don't look at all like that. So I think this has a, a tinge of, of racism in it. But those 17 guys were blindfolded and taken out into an adjacent yard and just simply shot there. And that's not where the story ends. Uh, this guy, I think, is, is, is one of the most interesting individuals in, in all of Texas history. And I'm sure you have heard of this. Uh, John Christopher Columbus Hill. Don't you think everybody should have four names, not just three names or two names? John Christopher Columbus Hill. He was 14 years old when he was captured at Mier, along with his brother and, and, and his father. Uh, his brother was a little, little older than he was. But he was befriended by the Mexican general and somehow sent to Santa Ana. Uh, and Santa Ana basically adopted this kid and sent him off to the colegio, the, 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 the uh, school of mining in Mexico City, which was one of the better universities there at that time. He also became a physician while he was in Mexico. Uh, the US minister to Mexico, Wadi Thompson, called him a very shrewd and handsome little fellow. And uh, really got a great education there, came to be known as Juan Cristobal Gil, G-I-L instead of H-I-L-L. -L. Uh, became quite distinguished, not only as a physician, but as a mining engineer, a civil engineer. Uh, married in Mexico, had four children. Uh, my good friend, uh, Mary Margaret, uh, has written this biography, a brave boy and a good soldier. And the story doesn't end there. Uh, he sent his son to Swarthmore College in the United States, returned back to Texas in 1895, moved to Austin and became a translator there for the General Land Office. Wow. And in 1897, became an honorary life member of the Texas State Historical Association <laughs> and died in Monterey in February of 1904 
uh, and is buried there. So he has to be one of the most fascinating individuals in all of Texas history, I think, uh, the boy survivor of the Mir expedition. Now, an armistice was kind of formally declared in June of 1943, and most of the prisoners who had been in Mexico, they were at Perote Prison. And if you go to Perote today, halfway on the road between, say, Jalapa and, and Puebla, uh, Perote looks today pretty much the way it did back then. It's still this almost like a medieval fortress. This is a view from the different direction. You can see uh, 8,000-foot 8, Pico de Orizaba in the background. I did a paper one time on the Americans who climbed these high volcanoes during the war with Mexico. Few people realize that Mexico has the third, the fifth, and the seventh highest mountains uh, in North America. But that's kind of a contemporary sketch of the Perote prison. Uh, some of the Texans, like Tom Green, got out of there. Uh, some of them were able to get all the way back to Texas. Jose Antonio Novato uh, was sent down to, to Veracruz and put in the prison there of San Juan de Aloa, which is a much more dreary place than this on the coast. And he was able to escape from there and make it all the way back to Texas. His story is as interesting almost as, as that of the boy hero uh, Hill. Uh, but let me, let me point out something that's, that, that, that's, that's really, really uh, significant. Uh, Texas continues, as a result of the Treaty of Velasco, to claim the Rio Grande. Let's, let's go back to one of those, those maps, if we can. Uh, oh, I forgot to tell you the rest of the story. Sorry. Uh, during the war with Mexico, following the Battle of Buena Vista, uh, the biggest battle in the war by far. Uh, some of these Texans went back into the desert, like 100 miles back into the desert, to Salado, and they forced the, the alcalde there, the leader of this small community, to show them where uh, the prisoners who had been executed were buried. And so the remains of these Texans were, were dug up, uh, placed in wagons, and they were brought all the way back to Texas and reburied in one of the more beautiful places in Texas at Monument Hill there overlooking the river, the Colorado River near LaGrange. And so if you ever get in that LaGrange area, by all means, go visit Monument Hill. There's some inaccuracies in the big monument that is there, but it it's, at least contains the bones of those who were executed at Salado as a result of the, as a result of the Mier expedition. Uh, under diplomatic pressure, as I said, most of those Mier prisoners, Santa Fe expedition prisoners, uh, were eventually released. Now, in the meantime, uh, the Mexicans had invaded Texas a second time under General Wool. So twice during the Republic of Texas, they, in, uh, they invade, they cross the Rio Grande. Uh, Wool got as deep into Texas as Vasquez had uh, the previous year. But I'm running out of time here, so let me quickly do the rest of the story for you. And I think the rest of the story uh, most of you know. Uh, in 1844, James K. Polk is elected president of the United States. That is really a momentous election. Uh, I think had Henry, Henry Clay been elected, that entire, that entire period of history could have been very, 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 very different. Uh, in December, of 1849, Polk, of course, signs the Texas Annexation Act. So after about 10 years, Texas now became part of the United States. Now, when Texas becomes part of the United States, Texas basically, uh, the United States basically inherits that Treaty of Velasco, inherits that claim to the Rio Grande and not the Nueces. Now, by 1845, Mexico had pretty well given up hope that they were ever going to be able to regain Texas, something they had somewhat, you know, really wanted and really desired. But that has become so impractical. They realize Texas is probably lost. But they will not acknowledge the Rio Grande as the boundary. Uh, Mexico continues to insist on the Nueces. Now, the Nueces is that small stream that starts up here in the in the hill country, uh, makes its way south, uh, 
not too far from Uvalde. And then it kind of turns east and then empties into the Gulf at, at Corpus Christi. Very, very small stream. Well, Mexico insists on the Nueces as the boundary. Well, Polk, in 1846 and 1845, sends the American army to Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi was just a little smuggling town of about 400 people living on a bluff there. And all of a sudden, you got this big American army under Zachary Taylor. And then in the spring of 1846, then, of course, Polk gives the green light for Taylor to move south all the way from the Nueces, all the way from Corpus Christi, all the way down here to the Rio Grande, where Taylor began constructing this large earthen embankment, Fort Texas, which will become Fort Brown after Major Brown, who died uh, in the fighting there. But that's direct defiance of the Mexican army that's right across the river. And Zachary Taylor even raises the American flag there, we think, on probably a cottonwood pole. Some people say he just took the tongue of a wagon and, and raised it there. And these emails fly back and forth across the river there. And of course, everybody was very polite back then. My dear sir, you know, get your ass out of here. <laughs> uh, and then the Mexican general writes back, and he's equally, you know, oh, my dear sir, you know, I can't do it. You know, you, this is Mexican soil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you just begin to see these war clouds just lowering over the Rio Grande there. And then, of course, this occurs when the Mexican army crossed the Rio Grande and attacked a company of dragoons at a place called Caracitos upriver. And then that is the pretext that Polk uses as to declare war on Mexico in 1846. And then Taylor is involved in a big battle there at Palo Alto. It's not the biggest battle in Texas. What's the biggest battle in Texas, Dr. Chris? Medina. Medina. Very good. You passed the class. Uh, but Palo Alto is big. The battle that followed that, Resaca de la Palma, is also a bloodbath. The Mexican army is driven across the river. And very quickly, this is the Mexican War in, in, in three minutes. Uh, Taylor will proceed into the interior. He will take steamboats, go up the Rio Grande all the way to Camargo. This is the way King and Kennedy made most of their money, was by steamboat contracting during the war. And then, very adventuresome, Taylor will advance across the desert, attack Monterey. That is a ferocious battle. That's a 10 times the Battle of Mier. It's house to house, street to street. It's the only battle that I know where American casualties actually came to outnumber those of the Mexican army. Uh, but the Mexican army eventually raises a white flag and agrees to retreat. And then Taylor will proceed in and capture the old capital of Coahuila in Texas at Saltillo. But he's very fearful of advancing south across that 300-mile desert there for fear that the Mexicans will come in and poison the water holes. And he just doesn't want to get caught out in the middle of nowhere. So he's just basically sitting there when Santa Ana, who has raised a new army, marches north, kind of the same army that he had taken into Texas in 1836. It's largely an army of conscripted Indians, but he does have some, some crack troops with him. And when Santa Ana attacked Taylor's army, on the first day of the Battle of Buena Vista there, it looked as if Santa Ana was going to win a decisive victory. And then the morning of the second day, uh, the Americans looked out and the campfires had been left burning in the night and the Mexican soldiers had left. Santa Ana retreats south, claiming that he had won a great victory. He has American weapons to prove it. But in reality, he had been defeated and that turns out to really be decisive because that gives Taylor complete control of northeastern Mexico. And then, of course, a small American army, the Army of the West, marched all the way along the Santa Fe Trail to capture Santa Fe when General Manuel Armijo, the same guy from the Santa Fe expedition, agreed to give up the city without a fight. And historians are pretty well convinced today that what happened was that uh, uh, General Kearney's quartermaster a guy by the name of McGoffin, uh, he and a couple of friends just went into Santa Fe and we think just bribed uh, Armijo. There's about $2,800 in quartermaster dollars that somehow just disappear there. And Armijo just retreats. So all the history books say that the conquest of New Mexico was bloodless, but there's a couple of footnotes to that. After the American army occupied New Mexico, 
there's an uprising there led, we think, by a priest in Taos uh, against the Americans, and then there's an uprising in another community of Mora, and the American uh, army just went in and smashed that, just brought in artillery and blew down the church in Taos on top of the insurrectionist. So maybe the initial conquest was bloodless, but then there was fighting that followed. Now, the Americans have their hands full with the, with the Native Americans in New Mexico, especially the Navajo, but Kearney continues west as Donovan continues south all the way fighting down here for control of Chihuahua, and then he eventually will go all the way down here and join Taylor at Saltillo. But Kearney, of course, will march all the way west, led by Colonel Christopher Carson. And then out here in California, of course, you've got the Bear Flag Republic. But Mexico continues to fight on. So Polk will send Winfield Scott with a large army down here to Veracruz. Uh, they will land almost 10,000 men in a matter of a day, one of the most successful, largest, really first big amphibious landing in American history. They will lay siege to Veracruz. Now, Santa Ana is an amazing person. I think we you know, vilify him because of what happened at the Alamo, but we kind of sometimes lose track of him and his ability to lead an army. Uh, he goes back down here, regroups the Mexican army, and tries to hold Taylor down here in what we call the, the Tierra Caliente, which is really uh, full of disease beyond imagination. You cannot keep an army there on that coast. Uh, I mean, you got yellow fever, everything you can imagine. So he thinks if he can hold the Americans there, he can still win the war. Well, Scott, who is probably the best of the American commanders, I think he's better than Taylor, he will come up here and decisively defeat Santa Ana at Cerro Gordo. Uh, and when you go to Mexico, it's one of the few places that you can still see the original battlefield there. And not only did they defeat Santa Ana, they basically chased him in his stagecoach, and some guys from the Midwest actually captured his wooden leg. He had lost a leg in, the, in a battle with the French in the Pastry War, and the guys indignantly carved their initials on it, and you can see that, I think, in a museum in, in Springfield today. And then there's fighting all the way around Mexico City itself. I mean, vicious, vicious fighting at Molina del Rey and Contreras and Churubusco. And then finally, the Americans are at the gate of Mexico City itself, uh, lay siege to Chapultepec. And uh, if we have people from Mexico, please don't throw anything. But the Mexican historians today have pretty well figured out that that story of the, the boy heroes of Chapultepec that is probably something that Mexico concocted as late as 20, 30 years after the war itself because she had been so humiliated and she badly needed heroes. But every American president that goes to Mexico City today goes and lays this wreath at the, at the place where it is thought that these boy cadets died near Chapultepec. And so that is such a, such a part of Mexican history today that if you dare challenge that source south of the Rio Grande, you're really taking your life into your own hands. Uh, so the Americans will take Mexico City itself, and basically the war is over. Santa Ana had fled north to San Luis Potosí, and I didn't think he had that much to do with the treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that concluded the war. But in that treaty, the United States will take almost 50% of Mexican territory. Now, only a small part of the population, only about 60,000 people, if you don't count uh, the indigenous peoples, but the United States took almost 50% of the territory of Mexico. So every morning when I get out and I walk out my front door, I can glance off to my left in Laredo, and I can see this huge Mexican flag flying on the border. It is a flag that is almost the size of a football field it cost, I think, almost uh, 40,000, at that, that time, 40,000 pesos. I mean, huge, beyond imagination. Now, the Americans have built a big flag themselves, but not quite that big. But I think what Mexico is doing with that flag is sending a message. And I think they're saying, OK, you gringos, you can't have any more land. Uh, you just can't have any more land. This is it. This is Mexico. You can't have any more land. 
But most of my students in Laredo, about 90% of them are Hispanic, and we frankly discuss these things in, in my Texas history class. And they tell me, and these are Latinos, we ain't giving it back. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Uh, since Jerry invoked my name, I will, uh, uh, I will uh, confirm that, that indeed Remington has not only bestialized but racial, racialized uh, the Mexican soldiers uh, who were involved in the Black Bean incident. We know that because Thomas Jefferson Green, uh, who did the memoir of the Mier expedition, had an artist with him, an artist who uh, was captured with the other Texan soldiers by the name of McLaughlin. Uh, whose illustrations accompany the history of the Mier expedition published by Thomas Jefferson Green in 1845. And indeed, he has a much more favorable and uh, uh, benign view of the Mexican, uh, Mexican soldiers. Even a famous scene of one Mexican soldier fainting as the prisoners are shot uh, who had draw, uh, drawn the black beans. I believe his name is William McLaughlin. Um, um, the, by the way, I first heard that tail gunner on a bread truck joke uh, 30 years ago from my friend Charles Carlton. Had nothing to do with uh, Laredo. He was a historian of the troubles in Northern Ireland. Uh, and uh, he told me the story about a, a fellow in Belfast who was a tail gunner on a, on a bread truck. Uh, so the same story uh, applied to a different set of uh, circumstances. Uh, and, and one other quibble, uh, it was not uh, Jackson that got the chicle from uh, Santa Ana. It was during Santa Ana's exile on Long Island. Uh, and he had an amanuensis by the name of Adams, as in the Adams company that makes chiclets. And his amanuensis, uh, Adams, said, what? You've been chewing that food forever. What is it? And he says, oh, it's not food. It's chicle. He makes a little sugar cane, a little chicle. You start chewing it. Adam says, send me some of that stuff. And uh, started a company that's still in existence. Um, one, of the, one of the real pleasures of, of being the, the moderator year after year of this symposium is that I get to meet so many really interesting people, some of whom I, I've, I've known for years, like Jerry Thompson, some of whom I'm meeting for the first time. Um, and that's Mark Stegmeyer, although he uh, uh, shares some of my old stomping grounds in North Texas and Southern Oklahoma as a professor and former department head at Cameron University in Lawton, Oklahoma. I'm from, in ba I'm from Baja, Oklahoma, just across the river in, in uh, Clay County, as, as some of you know. Uh, but uh, uh, g getting to know Mark and, 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 and getting to pick his brain about about, uh, about sources and stories having to do with this period that both of us have been uh, working on for a while, but only tangen tangentially. He really works for the most part in the 1846 to 1861 period. I think that's fair enough to say. Well, I think so. Uh, I w for me, as a historian of the Texas Revolution and Republic, the world sort of ends for me in 1846. Uh, I'm not responsible for anything that happens after that time. When I first started collecting stamps uh, and realized that the first genuine postage stamp was issued by Great Britain in 1846, I just said, even as a seven-year-old to myself, darn, you know, that we just missed having postage stamps from the Texas Republic. Um, uh, Mark uh, uh, has been working about as long as I have. We received our, our doctorates around the same time. His from um, the University of California in Santa Barbara in the mid-1970s. Um, the book from which he's going to draw much of his information today, and as well as his other researches, is one that was um, published in 1996 by the Kent State University Press and won the Coral Tullis Prize from the Texas State Historical Association for, uh, for uh, a best book on Texas in the previous year, but it's also just been re-released and paperbacked by the Texas Tech University Press, the title uh, of which is... Um, Here you go. Nope, oh, yeah. got it. Uh, it was my reading glasses that was the problem. Texas, New Mexico, and the Compromise of 1850, uh, Boundary Dispute, and sectional crisis. Um, one of the things I like most about Mark's work are his titles. Uh, he's got one called Cartography, Politics, and Mischief, 
uh, and there are several other titles, uh, some of which I would get in trouble perhaps if I read, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll leave him uh, to, to tell you what some of those are. But um, what I tell my students about the Compromise of 1850 is that it was an armistice. Uh, uh, the, 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 the people who were, the people who were uh, compromising were in the minority. Uh, the people who refused to compromise were in the majority. We will see if I've stolen his thunder or if he's going to disagree with me. Uh, but please welcome Dr. Mark Stegmeyer from Cameron University. <laughs> When, uh, when Jim finally reads the uh, last chapter of my uh, book there, he will discover that I firmly think it was a compromise. Okay. But, um, anyway, where's, oh, this little goodie. Okay. Um, now, I, I must say, uh, he mentioned 1846 to 1861 is my thing. And uh, true enough, it is. It uh, became that way when I started uh, into I graduate school at UCSB and I walked into a Jacksonian seminar with Lynn Marshall who was really into roll call voting analysis at the time. It was a big deal back in the 70s. And um, so my dissertation was a roll call voting analysis of U.S. Senate voting from 1846 to 1861. And um, when I got to the crisis in 1850, I had no interest whatever particularly in, in Texas history or the boundary dispute or anything like that at first. But when I started going over this very complex thing called the Crisis of 1850 with seven monstrous issues facing the country at the time, um, I was uh, analyzing all these roll calls, which were numbers on sheets mostly. And um, most, of the, most of it all made some sense because I could tell who was voting which way and they were voting in the ways I expected them to. And then all of a sudden, I started analyzing this set of roll calls which um, didn't make any sense to me. And there were 25 of them in the US Senate out of these 500 and some roll calls in that total session. And there, there were 25 of them that all followed the same basic pattern. And what was really crazy about these roll calls was that you had uh, in, these, uh, in this particular set of roll calls, the, all the Southern disunionists of the time, all the Southern radicals, and all the northern anti-slavery radicals, free soilers and northern Whigs, voting together. And I thought, hey, <laughs> this has to be crazy. So I started looking up just what all those votes were about. And I discovered they're all about the boundary dispute. And I thought, hell, that would be good to go through. And so I went and started looking over all the stuff on the Compromise of 1850 that had been written to see just what the other historians had said about this so I could cite them. And I found out that they hadn't said anything about it, um, that they hadn't even recognized that it was important. And you'd be surprised how many textbooks in U.S. history have still not caught up with the boundary dispute. I have read textbooks in U.S. history on the 1850 crisis which We'll mention all these various issues, California, fugitive slave law, slavery in your territories, all that good stuff. And don't even recognize that the boundary dispute was part of it. I mean, there are, <laughs> there's a lag time. <laughs> um, but uh, anyhow, I, I ended up uh, publishing my book in 1996. And um, I think I was able to prove pretty well that the boundary dispute uh, was the heart of the crisis in Congress, certainly, in 1850. And uh, more than that, I think it was the issue upon which depended more than any other single thing, the fate of the Union, and whether the North and the South might actually go to civil war in 1850. Um, now, the year after my book came out, and I'm glad I got mine out the year before this guy did, uh, Michael Holt very famous political historian at the University of Virginia. He came out with his my gargantuan history of the Whig Party. You ever seen this thing? It's about 900 pages long. Yeah. Well, anyhow, uh, Mike Holt came out, and he also came to the conclusion that, yes, the boundary dispute was the big deal. And more recently, uh, partly based on my own book, um, a, a more popular historian, but a pretty good one, 
Uh, Fergus Borderwich has uh, recently written a book on the crisis of 1850, and uh, he agreed that the boundary dispute uh, from his research was the issue that really uh, was what the fate of the Union depended upon at that point. So um, what I am going to do today is basically guide you through some maps and um, show you, first of all, just how um, confused the situation was on, on both sides. Um, of course, you're already familiar from having seen these maps up here um, in earlier discussions today, and I'm sure previously too, about uh, the Texas claim of 1836. Uh, the Texas Congress passed their boundary law in December 1836, uh, extending their boundary from the mouth of the Rio Grande uh, all the way up uh, to the sources of the Rio Grande and then directly north from there uh, to the 1819 uh, Adams and East Treaty line with Spain. And uh, of course that gives us what has been known as Imperial Texas. And uh, they claimed of course in that everything lying east of the Rio Grande. Um, and that included virtually all of the uh, what you would call settled areas uh, east of the Rio Grande including Santa Fe, Albuquerque, Taos, all those areas. Um, the, uh, the Texans, of course, would attempt at various times to actually impose their will unsuccessfully, as uh, Jerry has just uh, told you, uh, on, the, on the people in Santa Fe. Uh, that would not be the last effort on the part of the Texans to, uh, to do that kind of thing. But, um, the, uh, the boundary dispute between Texas and New Mexico basically begins here. And let me start with, to show you uh, something about the uh, ambiguities involved in this whole thing by moving on here. This is the map uh, without the colors uh, that was created by uh, John Distrinell in 1847, it's the, the treaty map, okay? It's just, I just don't have the colors on it. But uh, let me now hone in on uh, one particular part of that map, and that's the uh, upper Rio Grande Valley area of it. And uh, uh, let's do the thing here. No, that's not that one. Okay, right here. And <clears throat> what, uh, what Distrinell did he uh, colored everything differently on either side of the Rio Grande. And um, he made the uh, area west of the Rio Grande a, a green color to separate it from Texas, which is a much lighter color, east of the Rio Grande. Ah, but it wasn't that simple for Distrinell, because if you will notice on the map, over here where it is green, over here where it is green, it says uh, Nuevo Meco. And then on the eastern side of it, it says O Santa Fe. Now what is he trying to tell us? Well, on the one hand, by the coloring, that New Mexico's west of the Rio Grande. But on the other hand, when he's labeling it, he is saying that some of it is east of the Rio Grande. So it, this Trinell's map is confusing. And those confusions uh, continued in the, uh, in the 1840s. Um, let me uh, go now to um, a version of things that the Missourians had. Of course, the Missourians were interested in the Santa Fe trade across the Santa Fe Trail and uh, they didn't particularly want the Texans involved in uh, swiping any of that. Um, so this is a uh, map from um, the famous uh, Santa Fe trader, Josiah Gregg, in a very famous book called uh, uh, The uh, Commerce of the Prairies. 
1844. And uh, you can see that uh, the Santa Fe traders, uh, they certainly considered um, New Mexico lying on both sides of that Rio Grande. Um, I colored in the, uh, I colored in the red, <laughs> okay, to show you where the Rio Grande is on the map. And uh, so they, uh, they, had, uh, they had their view of it. Um, this is a very confusing situation also to, the, um, to Europeans at the time. And now I'm going to go back. Uh, yeah, one more. Okay. This is from a map uh, done in London in 1842 by uh, Thomas Riley in London. Uh, I think it was part of a, an atlas of that time. And um, it, is, it is kind of a fascinating thing uh, for showing how Europe, uh, people in England, they were confused about it. Uh, you will see that it says Texas over, uh, over there on the right side. But it also shows uh, Mexican provinces um, on both sides of the Rio Grande. Uh, Coahuila, Tamaulipas, uh, they actually crossed the Rio Grande on this map. And you also notice that there is no place called New Mexico on the map, anywhere. They have, the, they have Santa Fe and all those places on the map, but they, they, don't, uh, they don't have New Mexico on there, uh, or any label of New Mexico. Um, this, uh, by the way, is that map. And it, that's uh, that's uh, an original of the, uh, of the map. Uh, when I was in London a couple of years ago, my wife and I were there for a 40th anniversary trip. We went down to Leicester Square and uh, we were, you know, going through all these various maps and stuff down there. And uh, my wife found this. And uh, I had to have it because um, I was very interested in the, uh, very interested by that time, certainly, in um, the uh, fact that the Rio Grande had not really been much of a boundary of anything. And uh, sure enough, there was this map showing uh, a couple of the Mexican provinces actually covering uh, or actually crossing the Rio Grande. Uh, but this is, uh, this is the uh, Riley map uh, that we found in London. Okay, now this is um, a Mitchell map of 1846. And um, this one, um, again, is uh, somewhat ambiguous. Uh, it shows uh, uh, Mitchell. Uh, Mitchell has New Mexico uh, kind of right on the Rio Grande. He doesn't, he, he doesn't settle the issue one way or the other. Uh, so it was confusing to both the whole issue at the time was quite ambiguous. It was quite confusing to uh, map makers uh, here and in uh, in uh, London there at the time. And these are only a couple of examples. I mean, there there are uh, plenty of them that you uh, poss possibly could use. Of course, none of this uh, was confusing to the people in Santa Fe. They didn't consider themselves part of Texas. Period. And um, they acted um, as uh, part of a province of um, the Republic of Mexico. And in fact, they, uh, they were quite happy to uh, set up their own counties uh, in the 1840s on both sides of the Rio Grande. I think I took this one from uh, Robert Larson's book, uh, The uh, New Mexico Quest for Statehood. And you can see the the line of the Rio Grande there, um, heading all the way up. And, uh, you know, uh, they, they set up their provinces over on the eastern side. Um, and, you know, <laughs> thumb their nose at Texas and, uh, and the Texas claim. Now, you might wonder at uh, this situation uh, how President Polk would handle it. Well, uh, that was a problem. And, um, President Polk, uh, while he uh, sided with Texas on almost everything, uh, he was pretty ambiguous about this whole business himself. Uh, he sometimes uh, went, uh, he, he sometimes uh, tilted toward the Texan side of question, of the question. 
Sometimes he tilted toward the New Mexican side of the question. And uh, whenever the uh, Texans uh, asked Polk to you know, reinforce their Texas claim to New Mexico east of the Rio Grande, um, he would basically have his Secretary of State, James Buchanan, um, put them off in some way or another. And uh, the Texans would claim, well, hey, you know, we joined in 1845 uh, with our Texas claim. We assume that the annexation resolutions include all that. And uh, Buchanan would basically tell the uh, Texans, uh, well, you, you, you may have a real good claim and everything, but we've got to settle it later. And uh, that, it's really up to Congress and things like that. Uh, so he, you know, the administration kept putting them off. Um, of course, the Texans have their own view of it. The Texans at the time, um, they wanted to enforce their claim. So in uh, March of 1848, the Texas legislature goes ahead and establishes Santa Fe County. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> okay. It's, a, it's an imperial area right by itself. And uh, they uh, not only established this thing, but they also sent uh, an agent out there to Santa Fe. His name was Spruce Baird, and he was uh, supposed to be the judge of the judicial district, uh, the Texas judicial district out there. Well, <laughs> this guy Baird, if you, if you read <laughs> much in New Mexico or, or Texas history. Um, this guy was uh, a person who looked after his own interest first and everything else second. He might have uh, gone, at, once he went out there to Santa Fe and the uh, Colonel uh, Washington at that time, Colonel Washington, uh, was proved to be in no mood to turn uh, the, his you know, federal authority over in Santa Fe to this guy Baird. Uh, Baird figured out very quickly that the New Mexican um, Anglos there didn't want any part of him either. So um, he really changed colors and he goes ahead and he settles down in Santa Fe, becomes a lawyer and a merchant and does all his business interests and gives up everything for Texas. He, he just doesn't do anything else about it. And, and uh, this guy had been supposed to bring uh, a person along with him who was going to be the attorney general in the area. And uh, he left that guy cooling his heels uh, back in New Orleans uh, and uh, in Georgia at times. And uh, that guy just finally gave up altogether. Uh, James Webb was his name. So um, Baird, uh, Baird was not a very trustworthy person to go out there and uh, send to undertake this gargantuan task, uh, task of uh, getting, first of all, the um, federal commander to give up his authority to him, and second, to actually go there and organize uh, a county. Uh, but this is the way the, uh, the Texans did see it. and. Um, here is the map in 1849 that uh, the Texas General Land Office drew up. And uh, they're selling copies of it out there in the, uh, 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 at the booth of the General Land Office, I think, today. Uh, this is the inset from it that shows the whole Texas claim. And uh, you get enough sense from my uh, uncolored version of it here that uh, the, uh, the Texas, they have the Texas claim to everything east of the Rio Grande as a very different color uh, than uh, anything else in the region. Okay. So it, uh, it continues to be a big problem. Uh, the issue comes up in Congress, of course, in the uh, 30th Congress, and of course, the Texas delegation did a good job of putting forth their case in the debates over these matters. 
they, uh, they claimed, of course, that uh, the annexation resolutions were their best support and uh, that they felt that the federal government was holding uh, New Mexico for them as a trustee until they could actually send authorities there. Um, all they needed was a few more authorities like Baird. And, and <laughs> well, anyhow, um, they put forward those arguments. Uh, Northern anti-slavery guys, on the other hand, and also Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri. Uh, Horace Greeley, by the way, was in Congress, in this session of Congress. And uh, Horace Greeley uh, became very, uh, very determined. He and Benton together became very determined to maintain the integrity of New Mexico. Well, uh, they made arguments that um, were pretty good too. And that was, for instance, that the federal government had continued to maintain a consul at Santa Fe all this time. And they also uh, referred to the drawback laws of Congress, which permitted um, goods imported into the United States and on which um, tariffs had been, import duties had been paid at a point of entry in the East Coast, those goods were permitted to um, cross U.S. territory. But once they got to Santa Fe, those goods would be, uh, the, the drawback would be given to them. There would be a refund of the import duties on those that had been paid in the United States because Santa Fe would be foreign, foreign territory. Um, and they also used the argument of uti posedatis in Latin, which means uh, what you possess. Okay. And uh, they argued that uh, you, Texas can only claim what it actually possesses, and it never possessed this region. It never was able to take possession of it. So um, the argument had opened uh, in the uh, period prior to um, the 1850 crisis. The Texans did not give up easily. After they had uh, set up that one big county, they decided, well, that was too big. So the next year, uh, in December of 1849, the Texas Congress goes ahead, and it takes the one big county and creates it into four counties. Okay. They created into four counties, Santa Fe County up there to the north, uh, Worth County to the south, El Paso County, and then Presidio to the south of that. The, uh, they also send a new commissioner out there, uh, a guy named Robert Neighbors. Now this guy at least has a pretty good sense of his responsibilities for Texas. Okay. And uh, he does indeed uh, travel out there and the first place he stops to actually organize county, uh, a county is in El Paso. And he really couldn't do much about Presidio or Worth. Uh, but he, El Paso, of course, he could. And he actually did uh, go ahead and uh, organize uh, a county uh, out there and appoint officials and all that good stuff. Uh, but that's where things start going wrong for him. He knew that he was going to have a hard time when he got up to Santa Fe anyway. But one of his underlings, there were eight people with him, one of his underlings, a guy named William Coburn or Cockburn, I, you can pronounce it either way, but I don't know how he pronounced it. This guy had been a handyman at the Texas State Legislature and the doorkeeper there. And when he was at Doña Ana, which is a suburb of Las Cruces today, when he got to Doniana, <laughs> this guy Coburn, or Cockburn, he suborned the commander of the post there, a guy named Captain Enoch Steen, uh, with a Texas head right, granting this Enoch Steen um, uh, hundreds of acres of, of ground there, supposedly owned by uh, Guadalupe Miranda and various other Mexicans in the area, or Mexican Americans in the area now. And uh, 
Anyhow, Steen was really delighted with all this. He was going to make himself rich, and he was talking about mineral deposits in the nearby hills. I mean, he had visions, um, and all, all sorts of people have visions in these days. Well, he had visions, and he was suborned by this. But all those Mexican people in that area, they quickly got together, and they drafted a long protest about this thing. Coming through that area before neighbors left town was a George McCall, Colonel George McCall, and he was headed up to Santa Fe. Well, apparently, the Mexicans delivered this protest to George McCall so that he could carry it to Santa Fe. Neighbors knows nothing about this, knows nothing about the, the head right in the first place, which apparently was a swindle. Okay, pure, just a pure swindle on, I don't know how much Cockburn got away with, but it was a swindle. Anyhow, McCall goes up there and he gets to Santa Fe uh, quite a bit before Mr. Neighbors does. So Neighbors, I mean, uh, McCall was there on behalf of President Zachary Taylor. Now President Zachary Taylor was the sort of person who didn't know anything about how to do politics in Washington, but he knew how to do the military thing. And so he worked through military officers. And he had his idea of solving the sectional crisis by going ahead and getting both California and New Mexico quickly admitted as states in the Union, which the Southerners certainly were not happy about when they heard about especially New Mexico. And he sends this Colonel McCall out there as his agent. This guy is communicating directly with the White House through Colonel W.S. Bliss, who is Taylor's son-in-law and private secretary. Okay, all his communications in this time are with that guy. He wouldn't ordinarily be doing that. Well, anyhow, McCall is his secret agent, and he goes up there. Colonel Monroe, John Monroe, is now in charge at Santa Fe, and um, McCall and Monroe get together, and they start playing major politics in Santa Fe, and it gets really complicated then. By the time Neighbors arrives up there, they hate this guy because they blame him. For, they basically have in mind that he's the one behind the head right. And Monroe uh, wrote down to the uh, command, uh, this commander Steen down there uh, in Doniana uh, saying, you know, what you've done, I mean, you're going to force these poor people to lose their lands. And, and that is a violation of the Treaty of Guadalupe, for one thing. Article 9. Well, anyhow, it, uh, it was a mess. And uh, neighbors could get nowhere up in Santa Fe. So he ultimately withdraws and, and, uh, and tells the Texas uh, governor and uh, legislature, you know, we're not going to get anywhere there until you actually send troops there. OK? So. Um, this was Texas's attempt to uh, establish four counties. Now, in Congress, um, they were still playing with this thing um, in all of these sessions of Congress. Uh, Polk, at the end of his time in office, had uh, given his last word on the matter in his last annual message of December 1848. And uh, Polk, in that last annual message of his, um, portrayed his vision of things. And uh, he wanted, in that uh, message, the uh, Missouri Compromise Line of 1820 uh, stretched all the way across to the Pacific um, as a dividing line between free and slave. Uh, but he also. Uh, wanted a territorial government set up west of the Rio Grande, and he uh, tilted, you might say, a bit toward Texas here in his last tilt. And pursuant, along with that message, he had a map drawn up in the General Land Office, the U.S. General Land Office. Uh, it's in the, uh, it's actually part of the serial set, and uh, Serial 537, but uh, this is a this is what the thing looks like. Uh, just a second here. Let me 
go to my Texas New Mexico part of it. Okay. This is maybe the first map of the United States stretching from sea to sea. And it has been basically unknown, unheralded ever since it was drawn. Uh, but it's part, it's buried in the, uh, it's buried in the um, serial set. And uh, my map here shows basically uh, what uh, the tilt was here because he's got everything uh, east of the Rio Grande um, quite a different color. Um, New Mexico on this map is shown entirely west of the Rio Grande. Um, now, this map, by the way, was drawn by a guy named Ephraim Gilman, who was a draftsman in the General Land Office, the U.S. General Land Office. And um, Gilman based that part of the map on Distronel's map. Now, remember that Distronel's map the treaty map, that one um, was ambiguous. It had different colors on both sides, but it basically indicated that New Mexico also was part of, uh, was east of the Rio Grande too. No ambiguity here. He's got the wording of New Mexico all west of the Rio Grande, and he has a different color west of the Rio Grande too. So this was Polk's final tilt. Uh, in favor of, of the Texans this time uh, on the boundary thing. By the way, the archives, uh, the National Archives people uh, got one of these out of a volume. It was all folded up and uh, they flattened it out and then ran off copies and, and sent me one. Um, so that's how I happen to have a copy of the darn thing. Of course, um, we are now basically near the crisis in 1850. And some of you may be familiar with books that show a plan offered by Henry Clay of Kentucky on January 29th of 1850, which uh, would establish the line shown on this map. Several historians have claimed that this is Clay's line. You'll see this in a number of books. And uh, prominent, prominent historians too. This one's from uh, William Freeling's famous work, The Road to Disunion, volume one. And uh, here, is the, here is the same line shown in uh, uh, Holman Hamilton's famous book on the crisis of 1850 called Prologue to Conflict. Okay, so they both use it. Now, um, there is a problem with this. See, Clay, on January 29th, um, simply said, in suggesting a boundary settlement in general, or a model for the boundary settlement, that they should go up the Rio Grande to the southern line of New Mexico, and then across. The problem is that historians like these two have basically assumed that the southern line of New Mexico was the 32 degree line. And uh, I claim in my book that Henry Clay really didn't have a definite line in mind because it was questionable as to just where the southern line of New Mexico was. In fact, it would vary from 32 all the way to 34 during the crisis of 1850. I think Henry Clay in, 18, uh, in, in uh, January 1850 was not proposing a definite line of his own. He was suggesting a model from which they could work and his knowledge of uh, southwestern geography was very fuzzy, as indeed um, a number of people at the time uh, recognized in almost all the members of Congress. Their knowledge of southwest geography was very fuzzy. But I, think, I don't think Clay really had in mind here a particular line. 
because if you notice on this line, um, it would end up freeing all the slaves in North Texas if you divided it that way. And um, I don't think Henry Clay had any sense of trying to do that because he's interested in devising a compromise that'll hold the Union together, not one that will you know, <laughs> raise all kinds of other issues. And this would certainly raise other issues if he ended up uh, freeing the slaves in North Texas or trying to. I mean, I just think it was so foreign to his thinking. Um, and uh, okay, this is this is the way the lines are. Now, this these I've, these next two maps I've taken from uh, Randolph Campbell's um, well-known book, uh, An Empire for Slavery, uh, about Texas. And um, I have penned in the one line up there, that fairly thick line, to show you where Clay's line supposedly would have come. And it would have freed um, a, about half the slaves in Texas. OK, here's the, uh, here's the second of these. Um, these are percentages of slaves in, uh, in these counties. And again, uh, it would have ended up freeing some of the heaviest slaveholding areas uh, in Texas at the time. I don't think Clay ever had anything like that in mind. And uh, that's why I don't have in my book any, uh, any map showing Clay's plan. Because I don't think it was ever, I don't think he ever actually suggested anything like this. He said, go up to the southern line of New Mexico without saying where it was, and then across. Well, um, Clay at least opened up the chances for compromise because he did propose on January 29th, 1850, a very comprehensive uh, plan to solve all the problems. And that was quite an achievement all by itself, just uh, coming up with a suggestion to solve everything, when a lot of people thought that nothing was going to get solved. His was not the only suggestion. Uh, sometimes people tried to flesh these out in the coming uh, um, months. Actually, this one and another one I'm going to show you here in just a second were proposed uh, uh, about two weeks before Clay. And uh, this is on January the 16th uh, that Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri uh, made his proposal. And uh, Benton uh, had always been a big champion of New Mexico and its integrity, as you might be able to tell here. And he planned to have um, Texas way over there on the east in his plan. He planned to have a second new state um, next to that. And then this very large area would be ceded uh, to the United States and become New Mexico, or even maybe maybe more than that. Um, and he upstaged uh, a guy who had been needling him for a while, uh, a Mississippi senator who was a very pro-compromise guy named Henry Foote. And uh, these two would be uh, quite a quite a pair in the U.S. Senate in 1850. Okay, Foote, you can see what he wants to do. He wants to create another state called Jacinto, or Jacinto, or Jacinto, whichever. And then the large state of Texas there, all every, encompassing everything east of the Rio Grande, and then the territory of New Mexico west of the Rio Grande entirely. A good uh, southern view of things, but with an extra southern state. Now. Um, this is a plan that was suggested at the end of February, 28th of February, um, by Daniel Webster initially. It's usually known as Bell's plan, but in uh, doing a lot of research in the various newspapers of the period, I found that a number of the newspaper correspondents discovered that uh, actually Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, Senator Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, um, had devised this thing several weeks earlier and was going to offer it. Uh, Webster had already agreed with Henry Clay that he would, uh, he would support compromise. And um, he, um, 
I think he wanted basically here to try to flesh things out um, and with, a way, uh, with the idea of really garnering a lot of Southern support for this. And this kind of plan would indeed get a lot of Southern support. And uh, what he does here, he wants Texas uh, a sec and two new states south of the 34 line. And then the 34 line would be the southern end of, uh, or the southern uh, boundary of New Mexico. Uh, this seemed very, very pro-slavery as a plan to some of Webster's friends, though. And um, so some of his friends convinced him not to even begin to introduce this thing. And instead, uh, he got his fellow Whig, John Bell of Tennessee, to introduce it. And uh, he did on February 28th. And ever since then, it's been known as Bell's plan. But in fact, Daniel Webster drew it up. And I'm still curious about this darn thing. Uh, I think Webster may have had an eye down the road even to the election of 1852. I mean, he's still, old and decrepit as he was, was still thinking presidency. And I still think he might have had an idea, not only of settling this thing, but also maybe garnering a lot of Southern votes in 1852. I don't know. It's, it's, it's really tough to tell. I think I'm the only person who ever identified it as Webster's plan initially, but it was. Then we have another plan here. This one is um, one concocted by Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois, Senator, and his good friend in the House, uh, uh, Representative John McLernand of Illinois, and actually introduced in the House by McLernand and you can see that they also use the 34 line. They also use the 34 line as the southern boundary for New Mexico. Um, nothing ever comes of this either. Well, as time went on, the, um, uh, the various uh, elements out in New Mexico got into the act uh, under the tutelage of Colonel John Monroe and Taylor's agent, Colonel George McCall, they went ahead and held a constitutional convention out there, and uh, prior to asking, just prior to asking for statehood. And uh, this is the boundary of New Mexico uh, in their constitution of 1850. As you can see, they wanted to bite about, they wanted to bite off a lot of Texas. <laughs> Um, east of the Rio Grande. And uh, that is what they planned to do. Uh, they, they, they had a very extensive boundary to the east, too. <laughs> okay? But uh, this, is what they, this is the bite they wanted to put on Texas. In Congress, some people started suggesting that maybe they should try to combine all these darn measures together. The, especially the people who wanted California unalloyed with any other issue, like Benton, opposed any combination of these issues. But there were a lot of compromisers who felt that, hey, you know, if we can combine all the various territorial issues together in one bill, then that'll force all the friends of California to vote for all the others. OK? Um, well, that was the idea. And uh, they started playing around with that. In April, in April, um, my friend um, Henry Foote of Mississippi started going after Benton in a big way. I mean, he, he, he and Benton really disliked each other. Benton was roughly about twice the size little Foote was. Uh, Benton was a big pompous guy from, uh, from Missouri and had been for 30 years. Uh, well, Foote was this puny little guy from Mississippi he was short and thin, and I guess a lot of people thought he was crazy as a bed bug. But, I mean, he was, he, he was, you talk about a guy with a hyperactivity problem. He had a hyperactivity problem. He was always bouncing around the Senate, doing something. I mean, he just could never stay still. And um, he, he wasn't, he, he was not dumb or anything, but I mean, he's, he's one of the big people, support, he was one of the big supporters of this idea of an omnibus bill uh, by a special committee. Okay, 
Well, he starts attacking Benton on numerous occasions. On one of these occasions, Benton finally just walks out of the Senate on him. And then after John Calhoun died, John Calhoun of South Carolina uh, died, and uh, he, of course he was being lauded by Southerners as a great saint. Um, Benton got up and he attacked Calhoun. Uh, uh, Benton hated Calhoun. And he got up and he attacked everything about Calhoun's memory. And well, Foote got into it and Foote got up and called Benton a calumniator. This is on April 17th. Calls him a calumniator. That is a big, big word for a liar. Well, that was the last straw for Benton. He wasn't going to take it out of this little guy anymore. And so he got up and he came down the aisle running after Mr. Foote. Okay, well, Foote backed away. And of course, all these other senators, they get in the way of these two. Okay, so they're starting to lead Benton back up the aisle to his seat. Benton turns around, though, and what's he see? He sees that little Henry Foote is standing down there near the speaker's desk, and he's got a pistol in his hand, a loaded five-chamber revolver. Now, he never actually points it at Benton. He just holds it there. Well, that was enough for Benton. He was a very theatrical-minded guy, and he comes running back down the aisle. Oh, I want everybody to know a, a, a gun has been brought in here to assassinate me with, and he rips open his shirt, and he says, shoot, assassin, shoot. I mean, he really did. <laughs> well, of course, again, everybody gets in the way of these two, uh, but it scared the devil out of everybody at the time. And sure enough, the next day, they voted to have this special committee, because <laughs> they were scared about this. They voted to have the special committee. I am still not sure that Foote didn't actually egg him on until he did something like that uh, in order to get the committee appointed, but I can't, I can't do anything but even suggest that he might have done it for that purpose. Um, it's hard to tell what's going on in Foote's mind sometimes. Okay, well, the committee of 13 gets together, and the committee of 13 finally uh, on the 8th of May, comes out with this plan. This is the diagonal plan. Okay, from 32 on up to the intersection of the Red River with uh, the 100th degree of uh, west longitude. And that becomes this part of the, uh, uh, of the omnibus bill. That omnibus bill becomes subject of all kinds of debate, maneuver, votes, you name it, in the Senate until the end of July. A lot has happened in that point, at that, in that period of time too, because General Taylor died, or President Taylor died uh, from some gastric distress that he got at the 4th of July. Uh, gastroenteritis, I think it was, and then they turned him over to the doctors and they bled him and blistered him and maybe killed him. I, I, they gave him calomel, which is mercury, which is bad enough. But anyhow, the poor guy died on July 9th. I don't, you know, I think as long as he lived, there would have been no compromise because he, he didn't want any compromise. He wanted his plan, which was not going to go anywhere anyhow, but he, he couldn't work with Congress. Anyhow. He dies. When he dies, Millard Fillmore becomes president. Millard Fillmore, who had been listening to all this as vice president, uh, was a, an experienced Whig politician from decades back. He, um, he's a pretty bright guy. He, he's not well known today as a president, but without him assuming the presidency, I don't think we would have had a compromise. Um, he was a pretty intelligent guy, but he's one of these guys who likes to work behind the lines, you know? Uh, and behind the scenes. He let people know in Congress he was in favor of a reasonable compromise. And he appointed Daniel Webster as his Secretary of State. And uh, ultimately what happens is that uh, on July 31st, um, just when they think the omnibus might pass, the whole thing falls apart. The radicals realized in Congress, north and south, that all they had to do was extricate one part from it and the whole thing would fall apart. Guess which part they extricated? 
the boundary. Everything else fell apart. And um, once they were able to do that, it looked like the whole darn thing was over. But some people realized, like Stephen Douglas, that uh, it should have been separate bills all along. So he gets together with the guy who had helped dismantle, inadvertently, the omnibus bill, Senator James Pierce of Maryland. And Douglas and Pierce then work out the boundary that Texas has today. Uh, and they didn't want any diagonal lines in it. Uh, they wanted uh, the meets and bounds of uh, latitudes and longitudes. So uh, the boundary that Texas has today is the subject of what is known as the Pierce Bill. And they drive that one through the, they, they drive the Pierce Bill through the, uh, uh, through the Senate pretty quickly. And President Fillmore is now very supportive of all this. Um, then it goes to the House of Representatives. And um, in the House, the biggest struggle over any, any bill of the whole compromise business is over the boundary, was over the boundary bill. And they concocted what they called the little omnibus. They combined the boundary settlement with a payment of money to Texas for giving up New Mexico uh, to pay off its uh, debt, and um, also the New Mexico territorial government. They combined these three in the little omnibus. And um, after gargantuan tactical maneuvers uh, and attempts to destroy this thing, it passes in the House in early September um, by a very slim margin by about 10 votes in the House. I forget the exact vote. Um, and when it does, everybody realizes that everything else is going to go through. Because that was the crucial one. Everything else did go through, and by very sizable margins, too, on di of different um, uh, groups on each one. But the one that was really the killer in this whole business of the crisis was the boundary dispute, and that was the one that both the northern and southern radicals realized if they were going to destroy any hope for a compromise, and of course the essence of a radical is they want it their way or no way, well, they realized that that was the only issue upon which they might possibly be able to vote together on procedures and various other things. And um, once that passed, the radicals had lost. And everything else passes then in succession. And the Compromise of 1850 came to be. As for, um, and then they got Texas to agree to it. Um, Representative David Kaufman of uh, Texas had a lot to do with this. He borrowed a map that, uh, Senator, uh, that Congressman McDowell of Virginia had used based on the Distronel map. He had the General Land Office uh, make more copies of this map that McDowell had had them make. And uh, I call it Kaufman's map. There are various copies here in Texas. This one, I think, is from the Dolph Briscoe Center. Uh, but I've seen it in the um, uh, state archives, too. Well, the, um, this map. Uh, was designed to influence the people uh, in the legislature. And uh, given the distortions in the uh, Distronel map that this is all based on, it made, the, um, it made the area given up by Texas seem a lot less than it was. Okay, And uh, I know Cordoba and Kreutzbar in the general, land, uh, you know, uh, with their much better map, much more accurate map, they were just beside themselves in anger at this, at the use of this crazy thing. Um, but it influenced the Texans to accept the compromise. And thus, uh, thanks to a whole lot of people and a whole lot of maneuvers, um, the boundaries of Texas are as they uh, are today. And uh, Texas made a good deal for themselves. They gave up land, which they had never really had any uh, possession of. Uh, they, um, 
they could probably never have gotten a hold of it. Uh, there were Texas troops all sent to move on Santa Fe and federal troops being reinforced in Santa Fe, so that's where the real war possibility would have been if they had actually gone there. Um, the, uh, the Texans got to pay off their debt with the money, and they still had one darn big state left. I mean, like they say in the ads uh, for this state, I guess they still do, it's a whole other country. Well, it is. And uh, thus you have how all these vicissitudes of boundary plans and confusion earlier ended up with the boundaries that we have uh, between Texas and New Mexico today. I thank you. I hope we got some time left. <clears throat> Well, I think he convinced me uh, that uh, the key compromise came on that boundary dispute. It's the one thing, as he said, on which the radicals on both sides could agree. Uh, the Federal Fugitive Slave Act, which was part of the compromise, uh, was opposed by the Northerners and supported by the Southerners, uh, abolishing the slave trade in the District of Columbia, just the opposite. Uh, the radicals on either side could certainly not agree on those, but they could make a push to uh, uh, to keep to mess up that boundary dispute. And so, um, a compromise on that may have opened up uh, the armistice on the others. So I'll go halfway uh, towards oh, okay. towards the uh, towards the compromise, but still see an armistice between the radicals who opposed each other on the issues uh, associated with slavery. Um, we have time for some questions, uh, about 20 minutes. Uh, and anyone who wants to ask, please stand and shout. Or you could just stand and shout and not ask a question, but. Yeah. Santa Ana was a POW when he signed the Treaty of Alaska. Would any government owe those in the Republic of Texas any obligation to pay back recognize this treaty? The question was uh, about Santa Ana being a prisoner of war when he signed the Treaty of Velasco, and could any government have recognized that treaty? Jerry? You mentioned. Well, treaties have to be ratified. Uh, John C. Calhoun and the Republic of Texas signed a treaty in 1844. It's often cited by Tom DeLay as giving Texas special rights. The only problem is it was defeated in the United States Senate, and you don't get any rights from a defeated treaty. Uh, and so uh, that, that Treaty of Velasco uh, would depend on the ratification by Mexico, and it wasn't going to happen. Is that fair enough? Any dissent? <laughs> uh, second part of the question. Second part of the question. Would any government other than the Republic of Texas which recognized the treaty. No, no government was going to recognize the Treaty of Velasco. Uh, yes. Uh, not in the sense, uh, but just uh, clarification. The Republic of Texas never ratified the Treaty of Velasco. Uh, it would have been useless to do so. Right, but it, it, it did not. The, the treaty is ratified by neither the Republic of Texas, neither the Republic of Mexico, because once the secret treaty which we haven't talked about, was revealed. There was enough um, public outrage that nothing ever occurred. So uh, the Treaty of Alaska really was an armistice as opposed to yeah. an actual treaty. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. for those of you who couldn't hear, the Treaty of Alaska was ratified by neither country and was, as he says, more of, a, of an armistice uh, than, um, than a treaty. But yeah. even that armistice is, uh, is not exactly uh, the best phrase because I think Greg Dimmick would argue very successfully that it may have been the sea of mud uh, which convinced uh, the Mexicans to turn their strategic withdrawal into a general retreat uh, rather than a strictly military or diplomatic decision. Yes, sir. Of course, the United States and a number of European powers recognize the Republic of Texas 
And is there any evidence in any of the uh, treaties that were signed by the countries with the Republic of Texas that discussed what boundaries that they recognized with the Republic of Texas? The question was whether any of those countries, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Great Britain, France, the others who recognized the Republic of Texas diplomatically, including the United States, if they defined in their treaties the, the boundaries of Texas. And my, my uh, uneducated guess is no, they did not, because it was not necessary and it would have been controversial. Is there any, anyone who wants to comment on that? I think you're right. No, they didn't. Uh, they you didn't need the mic. They didn't specify. Oh, they, they didn't even specify boundary in the um, Treaty of 1844, and uh, in the annexation resolutions either. Uh, so I, I don't know anything about any recognition from the other um, uh, countries, and and whether any kind of boundary arrangements were made with those. I, I know nothing about that part of it, but um, I can only speak to the uh, provisions of these other things. The most significant issue with regard to boundaries uh, in the joint resolution of annexation, that act of, that act of the United States Congress, which brought Texas into the Union, or I should say invited Texas into the Union, rather than the failed treaty, was the provision that Texas could draw internal boundaries, uh, dividing itself into uh, up to five states which could then individually ask for admission into the Union, but that it would be the, up to the Texans to decide how they would divide themselves. And one of my favorite parlor games uh, is to go back and see if I can divide current Texas into, into five reasonable states. I'll give you my version of it. Take all the area where Spanish moss is, with Houston the capital, and you can either call it moss land or, based on those critters that were in my rice dorms back in the 1960s, roach land. Uh, <laughs> then you take everything uh, within a couple of hundred miles of the Rio Grande and call it revuelto, uh, which is the Spanish word for scrambled eggs, and uh, it, it may be pretty well s s scrambled. You take uh, w the West Texas of the Comanches, uh, Ten Bears said, there is nothing here to cast a shadow on me. He was right. There was nothing there. Uh, you call that Bleakland. Then you take that nondescript part of Texas that I'm from. Uh, I was born in Wichita Falls and grew up in Henrietta. You call it Baja, Oklahoma. And then what you've got left is that area around Austin. Uh, Austin, Georgetown, San Marcos. Uh, and what uh, my, my good friend Charlie Yates from Austin says is that the best thing about that city is that you can drive 50 miles in any direction and be back in Texas. Uh, Charlie is a fairly conservative type. What I, so what he and others have suggested is that you take all the Democrats, liberals, hippies, and other undesirables, squeeze them into that, and we call it Tejas Libre. <laughs> So Dr. those are my five. You Dr. can come Crispa, up with your I have, own. A, I have another suggestion. Another suggestion from Dr. Uh, Thompson. Mirabeau B. Lamar got really upset at Houston more than once, as you know, and he learned that Houston had donated a book to the Library of Congress called Houston and My Republic or something like that. And I think he's communicating with David G. Burnett. I don't remember. But he's quite irritated, and he said, uh, you know, who, do, who the hell does Houston basically think he is? Houston and his republic. Then he pauses for a few minutes and he says, well, the more I think about it, I said, maybe we should just call this whole place the Big Drunk's Big Ranch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Houston and Lamar got together to uh, create the Philosophical Society of Texas, which someone mentioned earlier today. Um, when they moved the capital to Austin uh, and when the Houstonites and Lamarites fell into fighting, uh, the Philosophical Society of Texas pretty much dissolved and wasn't started again until 1935 and 36. But it was founded here in Houston in 1838, and it's been resuscitated. And uh, some of us uh, uh, have been associated with that in, uh, with that institution. Uh, and some which, of us have resigned. And, and others of us have resigned. Uh, we're not saying who's who. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. I have a question for uh, Dr. Thompson, uh, since you mentioned Houston. Uh, one of the books I read on the Muir Expedition, I, I don't remember the author's name, I 
embarrassed, but anyway, it's uh, Soldiers of Misfortune. Yeah, so that's Hayes. Sam Hayes, uh, that's Sam Haynes, Soldiers of Misfortune. Really, really a great book. But it is a great book. It is a great book. And uh, I don't, if I recall reading the book, he did not come across any hard evidence uh, or smoking gun, so to speak, that Houston had ordered the recall of Somerville. Have you found anything in your uh, research or reading that would indicate that uh, Houston had directed him to return once they hit the uh, Rio Grande? You know, I really don't know. It's been a long time since I've worked with that. I know that, that Houston was really upset with what happened in, in Laredo. He called it a dastardly deed. Uh, and I know he just kind of disassociated himself with the Army at that point, but I don't know to answer your question. The, the question had been whether Houston had actually ordered Somerville to yeah, withdraw know. or come back from the, from the Rio Grande. There's one thing that, that was, uh, that was uh, left out to a certain extent of, uh, of Sam Haynes' book, uh, and that is what was going on in San Antonio uh, prior to the Mier expedition, the Somerville expedition. And that was uh, an assault on the, on the Bejareños, which was every bit as disturbing and as, uh, and as uh, unjustified as the assault on, um, on Laredo. Uh, it was one thing that was mentioned earlier. Jerry, I think you may have misspoken when you said that Samuel Maverick was captured during the Vasquez expedition. It would have been under the Wall yeah, expedition right. later in the 1842. Right. And as one of the great defenders of Juan Seguin, I would point out that Seguin knew about the Vasquez expedition, warned the city of San Antonio, warned the Republic of Texas, so they were ready for the Vasquez invasion and the capture of San Antonio. But he was falsely, Seguin was falsely accused of treason uh, between the two, resigned his, as mayor of San Antonio that summer, uh, was f f essentially forced into exile in Mexico where he was given the choice of imprisonment, death, or joining the Mexican force as it reinvaded Texas, and he chose the last one of those. And without Seguin to warn them, the Mexican army surprised the district court in session and captured the judge, the jury, the lawyers, including Maverick and, and, and most of the people in the court and hauled them off uh, across the Rio Grande. Yes, sir. Um, in the waning days of the Tyler administration, I, I believe it was John C. Calhoun as Secretary of State that was so instrumental in cobbling together all of the, the efforts that culminated in the, the annexation resolution and in the... Not in the resolution, in the treaty. I, well, was it Calhoun who cobbled together the resolution? Well, the annexation resolution mm -hmm. that, that ultimately was successful. Um, Calhoun is really the one that's responsible for, for getting it all put together. But in, in the negotiations with the treaty also, um, there is clearly in the National Archives a map a State Department, U.S. State Department map. Uh, I've seen it because when I worked for Jerry Patterson at the land office, we copied it. And there's a copy now in the land office that clearly shows the boundaries as Texas um, uh, was claiming them to be. And that, without any doubt, was the basis for the treaty. It was going to accept those boundaries and also the discussions of the annexation resolution accepted those boundaries as well when Calhoun was asked about it. But, was it. but those boundaries were not formally included in the joint resolution of annexation? But that was the map that was used in the discussions. Yeah, there was, a, there was no question that, that the United States was sympathetic to the Texan claim. Uh, it, it was also true that the Texan claim was wildly exaggerated. Uh, well, I don't think anybody cared. Uh, on this side of the boundary, perhaps. That's right. Uh, uh, any others before we uh, adjourn to the book signing? Well, if not, I want to thank you so much for coming. Somebody with a hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I've, there's a glare behind here. An, an announcement. Uh, uh, please welcome Jeff Dunn. Thank Jim and our speakers. And now that you stay through the whole thing, you get a special prize. We're giving you away a prize. Uh, and it is a, uh, there's a brand new San Jacinto app available from the Texas State Historical Association. It's um, produced in conjunction with uh, Joe Sarah Media, and it's a 
multimedia uh, enhanced ebook. It's got a couple of articles in it and panoramic views of the battleground. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a question. The person who comes closest to what you have to have an iPhone or an iPad, by the way, to do this, to download it. And, uh, but, the, but the quiz is, uh, how old was Santa Ana and how old was Sam Houston at the Battle of San Jacinto? And if you've got an iPad, iPhone, would like to answer the question? Yes? I would say 41 and 43. Who was 41 who was 43? Anybody, anybody else? Any other guesses? Well, the ballpark about 1792. Okay, well, you're, you're the closest. Actually, it was Houston was 43, Santa Ana was 42. So you, you get it. You come up here and I'll give you the code. <laughs> but, but that's it. Thank you very much for coming to our 2013 Sages Center Symposium. Book signing will be up here. I could get close, but not as good you as this. You want to buy some books. Those who might want to sign books can come up to the table and those who want them signed as well.